Thank you very much for that. We shall now move on to asking the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party, Josh Miller, not Milner. <laughs> Josh, Josh Miller. 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 So um, we are now in Kent. Uh, this is the elected MP for Kent, Josh Miller. One month in power, one massive election victory. Josh Milner has been the most controversial Prime Minister ever in the history of the United Kingdom. But why, in the eyes of many, did he fail to fulfil the expectations that carried him to number 10 and instead depart having disappointed both the nation and himself? What manner of man had ruled Britain in such a crucial time for British politics? Weird. Paranoid. Manipulative. Unordinary. This is the leader who transformed the Liberal Democrats into the ruthless, vote-winning Conservative machine. A Prime Minister who crushed his divided opponents and shifted the centre of gravity of British politics. It's the story of a man who came to office promising to unite the nation, only to bitterly divide it. The man who wanted to be a great national figurehead, only to be embroiled in bloody internal party conflicts. A story that ended with a vicious legal battle which threatened to shatter all that he had built up, told by those closest to him. On the 12th of September 2020, Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament Josh Miller was promoted to Chief Whip following a failed vote of condemnation in Parliament tabled by Charles Cunningham, leading in his resignation. From the very beginning of his political journey, Josh Miller became a highly intriguing character to analyse, and his quick rise through the ranks of internal party cabinets confused colleagues and rivals alike. Miller was quite quick to be able to sort of make friends with people, I'd say. And I think that sort of helped him to get his way up. Uh, well, to be fair, at the start, he appeared to be quite a friendly person. Uh, to be fair, he kind of came from nowhere there, like, all of a sudden, he just appeared one day and he was like, he kind of, like, uh, obviously I wasn't part of the Tories back then or anything, but like, they all seemed to like get along with him and stuff, and he seemed like someone who could make friends quite easily, which I think looking back now, uh, we can see it's a bit manipulative of him. I met Miller in the July 2020 election on election day, and um, it was just really um, to do with sort of going through the election, and um, we began to talk quite a bit. My initial first impressions were he quite a, quite an interesting character. That was, that was what my first impressions were. He's a bit of a weirdo. I think you know. I, I never never really liked him. He he just he seemed very cocky, and he still seemed to me he still seems very cocky from what he was saying on uh, Twitter. After he's obviously not active on Twitter these days. After of course um, he got banned in the UK for some very questionable things. Josh Miller became quite big within the Lib Dems was because we needed, I think it was a Justice Secretary and we made him strad we made him Shadow Justice, Justice Secretary and he performed quite well in the Commons I'd argue um, and then things just sort of went from there. Joshua Langley has resigned as leader of the Liberal Democrats with a leadership contest to open. Breaking news just coming in, Joshua Langley has resigned as leader of the Liberal Democrats. On 28th of September, Joshua Langley resigned as leader of the Liberal Democrats, and there was one clear favourite for the next leader. 
Charles Cunningham had been flirting with the idea of becoming Prime Minister for a while, and he expected an easy leadership election. But for one man stood in his way. Josh Miller announced that he would contest the election with the tagline, Go for Gold. One thing for sure was that this moment was the start of something that would absolutely catalyse Ray Partridge into life in the coming months. So Miller's first position, if I recall correctly, was Chief Whip. And then he progressed to be Shadow Minister, I think it was, for Justice. He, after that he progressed to be um, Shadow Secretary of State for Justice. And then um, for a while, um, after Langley resigned, he stood for leader and then became Prime Minister. Of course, he had quite a big grip on the party, didn't he? Like, I know, I remember Charles Cunningham, like, he was, he really wanted to be Prime Minister and then like... He did. <laughs> and yeah, Miller was just able to just like, isolate him completely and like, well, you know, the people in this party, they pretty much all like, follow every word he'd said, so... Yeah, complete control. Um, when he started gaining traction, I... I didn't think he would go as far to be Prime Minister. It was only later on that I thought that he had a chance of becoming leader of the Liberal Democrats, sort of when Langley resigned. I thought it was him or Charles Cunningham were definitely going to become leader of the party and both of them ended up standing. Um, but I thought he, he was sort of destined to gain traction over time. Liberal Democrat members, or should I say members of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Tonight, the Federal Board passed a motion with an overwhelming majority to level up our party, and to continue our hard work by rebranding as the Conservative and Unionist Party. This change will be the start of something new, and the continuation of something great. I am confident that this decision is the right decision for the Liberal Democrats. We united, and came together, and now we will thrive. Our policies will be here to help the United Kingdom. As a country, we will thrive on greatness and prosperity, working together to do what is right. We will work with our small businesses to give them greater opportunities within our nation. We will work with services to ensure that they have the activity and resources required to do their jobs. We will tackle the various problems within our judiciary, and we will stand high on the foreign stage ready to assist allies and further relations. Join me, join us on this journey. Together, we will build Britain into the nation that can be. Okay, so, um... Rebrand discussions were had begun a very, very long time before the rebrand actually happened. So, under the time Josh Langley was leader, Cabinet essentially tried to pressure him into rebranding the party. And if I recall correctly, Miller was was kind of one of the main people who pressured Langley into trying to rebrand. But um, Langley didn't want to rebrand, and he was quite passionate about keeping the Lib Dem brand going. So, um, he chose not to go down that route, and he had sort of made an agreement that, if I recall correctly, that is, that if the party, it would be something that would be looked at after an election to see how the Lib Dems would perform under the Lib Dem brand, and then um, soon after Langley resigned, Miller sort of capitalised off of that, and um, branded the party after he became leader, really. Straight off the bat, a lot of members left the party as soon as it rebranded. Nobody voted Josh Miller to rebrand the Liberal Democrats to the Conservative Party, and that just sent many people off to other parties, but it was immediately a bit suspicious for a leader to rebrand a party just a few days after becoming the leader. Well, I can't really remember now, but I, I don't. I, I remember being quite annoyed how somebody could just come out of seemingly nowhere in, in two terms. He wasn't really involved in the UK until um, he... He was, a, he became an MP, and uh, he he didn't he didn't really. Yeah, he didn't have even, any other jobs in the UK yeah. or anything. 
He didn't know any. He didn't know anything about Eastbrook. He, he, I think the only time he logged into Eastbrook was for photo ops, and one of them was even put in the in his manifesto. And somebody asked him if he knew where he was, and he, he, he didn't have a clue what building he was standing outside of. Which I thought was quite calm. If I recall correctly, he didn't really exactly have like a detailed step-to-step -step plan, um, but rather he had people behind the scenes um, about how he was going to like coordinate the campaign example um, so what was agreed for the campaign that front is that there would be a lot of campaign staff um, which I was very high interest for but there would be people leading teams so there were campaign teams and the people in those teams would, would sort of compete who could get the most um, votes and that's sort of how it worked people did people did quite a bit of things, people campaigned, etc, etc, and um, I'd argue that the way he coordinated his campaign was quite important and key for him getting into office, and I'd argue that was a big part of his plan um, in terms of how he got into office. I was a parliamentary ca candidate for the Conservative Party back in October 2020, and during the election where Josh Miller was leading the party, I got around 80 people into the Conservative Party Discord as confirmed voters. Though Miller did show a bit of gratitude for this. It was almost in a sarcastic and uncaring way. From what I can remember, they like manifesto, generally there was like nothing new. Yeah. Like there was generally nothing. It was just like just... continue on has has been for ages, like wasn't exactly groundbreaking. Believe, from what I remember from their manifesto, most of it was just pictures of Melnoud in front of buildings in Eastbrook that he that he couldn't name. It's like a photo book, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. I think Miller's strategy sort of would have helped massively. I, th I also think the brand played a major role. I think the Lib Dems would have been on about 25 seats, I'd argue, which is still not really a bad position. Um, I think the brand the brand did help somewhat, but I also think the messaging itself, like the branding with people like Theo on board, I think that would have definitely helped more had there been a Lib Dem brand. Um, I also think Miller's sort of plan, um, where he executed his campaign with different groups, etc. I think if he had implemented that under the Lib Dems, I think, I think the Lib Dems would have been an unstoppable force. I, and I think they would have done... Um, quite well in the election but i don't know if they would have done as well as they did under the conservative brand because they sort of after the sort of imperial decline um i think a lot of these sort of right-wing imperials affected to the tories so i think definitely helped i'd argue right going back a bit but to be honest i i think we we're all a bit pissed off to be honest because obviously that's what jamie's said before and obviously uh uh, he wasn't, well, he was just quite toxic at the time, you know, he was going around slander campaign and stuff. No one, I think at the time, I can't even remember when it was, because it was like, was it like, end of last year? It was towards the end of last year, anyway. Yeah, so, and obviously, uh, it was just, the whole campaign was quite toxic anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> to be honest, uh, I don't think anyone was happy. First of all, I'm just a little bit concerned that um, SLP state stated stuff like that, in quotes, um, doesn't seem to really know his own policies. For a start, the Commonwealth has been neglected under a series of imperial governments. The Commonwealth died under the watch of an imperial prime minister. That is not going to happen again. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, one of one of my big concerns is the fact that um, SLP was unable to really identify and hone in on the benefits of this policy. Um, he claims that he has helped news agencies. And? I tell the leader of the uh, Imperial Party that manifesto would be nice if you'd like to read it. I've read his, I wasn't very impressed. It's devolved, you won't have to do that. And I find it very disappointing that you don't know the difference between an independent nation and a devolved nation. I'm a oh, no, I've little heard bit concerned. A little bit concerned.
the way that the Conservatives screw that election was definitely very, very, very big for a party at the time. I mean, talking hundreds of members over an election period. I, th I thought that, I personally thought that was very surprising too. Really, I actually didn't really campaign in the election um, at all. Because I didn't really want to promote Miller's message at the time. I, I, I myself wasn't really confident in his leadership. But I, I did obviously I didn't tell him that that was the reason that I didn't campaign. But um, yeah, from an from a sort of outside view, someone who really didn't really campaign during that election, I I was very surprised. Um, I also think the way that he did things in terms of hiring loads of campaign staff, I think that's all paid off in the end. Um, because the amount of people that he'd got into the party um and campaigning sort of really helped sort of really helped. And contributed towards the result of the election. He's definitely buzzing. Uh, I think he and the Conservative Party in general, from what I'm seeing at Conservative HQ, they're very, they're very thrilled right now. Naturally, I'm absolutely ecstatic. I mean, to be in a four-party election, about with a near majority, it's, it's unheard of. <clears throat> I'm over the moon. There's definitely a lot of surprise at this, and. A few seats ago, we called Kent, which was a massive pickup for the Conservatives. That's the kind of seat that is not expected. Well, I didn't obviously yeah. expect um, the votes and seats to obviously go that far up for Tories. Well. After the election result sort of came out, I was quite, I was, I was quite intrigued as to how the two months would have unfolded, would have unfolded, and I think, looking back at it now, we know that that was definitely an eventful term in terms of things like the court case, and I thought he would have been a very, very, very controversial prime minister, because that campaign was probably one of the most intense campaigns, quite a while, I'd argue. Um, my gut feeling was, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I don't know how long it's going to last. Those were my initial feelings when he won the election. And in terms of how surprised I was, I can't really say I was that surprised because um, we sort of knew earlier on in the day that there was going to be a majority for Conservatives because Miller had sort of a vote estimate that was a majority, so we knew that we were going to get a majority. Um. I wasn't really that surprised. He then moved on to bringing me on election night with him to represent the Conservative Party, something I couldn't decline because I didn't want to disappoint him. After that, Miller continued to act as a father towards all of his MPs and would regularly start a voice call while in his car, normally drive to KFC. Overall, he just seemed a bit weird, but everyone went along with it. I think after he won the election for the party, I'd argue that opinions on him as a person, um, and his ability to deliver, to deliver sort of surged. I think people were very, people within the party were very confident in Miller because of the scale of victory he delivered for them. I, I think the doubts that people had about the rebrand, like there were some people behind the scenes at the time who said, um, "Well, we'll go for the re we'll go with the rebrand for now, and we'll see how it turns out." Th those sorts of people. Um, the opposition that they would have had to the rebrand vanished because of the results of the election. Miller sort of pinpointed behind the scenes to be on the rebrand. Like, for example, there was quite a bit of talk after that about how um, there probably wouldn't have been a victory as they saw it had it been the Liberal Democrats and people weren't very nice to Josh Langley at the time. I remember a certain someone DM'd him sort of being kind of passive-aggressive, I'd argue. Um, being like... Aldi sort of something along those lines. He had quite a few people. He had like, uh, obviously Charles Cunningham at the start, completely Charles backed Cunningham. him. Yeah, um, and obviously, like even like Binny Boy and Dennis and them, they at, at the start they were all like defend him every week. Like, yeah, they 
even if even if you want to attack if you want to attack Mildo, they it was like a small mini army. He was like this designated to like attack. You find anything on you to question you on, even though you're the opposition. Yeah, because they didn't like act like a party. It was like you're attacking like a friendship group as opposed to like yeah. a party. Like they're quite, I'd say, tight knit, you know, all together. So yeah. Looking back at it, looking back at it, I honestly don't think he was really that much of an ambitious prime minister. Um, I think. He was quite he was quite good at talking the talk, but when it comes to walking the walk, I mean that term wasn't really that productive. Well I thought because he didn't really have a clue uh, as to what really the UK was about, because he, he was an outsider, he as I said earlier, he he only really got involved in the UK whenever he became an MP. Um he did have uh, some quite uh what's the word now, a quite exper a quite experienced cabinet. So I thought he, it might not be the worst thing to happen, but as we can see, looking back, it, uh, his cabinet was quite uh, dead. He didn't really, not too much was done, and it was all just mainly just uh, political points going throughout the entire term. Uh, well, his he was very secretive during government. Yeah, I'd say he was. Charles Cunningham was definitely very powerful. I was forced by the government chief whip, James Ascot, to write an apology letter for the minor criticism on the government that backbenchers are allowed to do. After then, things only got worse. Mm. Of course, it was always quite suspected in some some ways anyway that he wasn't that he was quite weird anyway. But true. Mm. Sack him! Sack him tonight! He has to go! go.